well-known Bible verse. God so loved the world. Now, well-known, of course, is a relative term. Uh, there are many, many areas of uh, human interest in which somebody might say, this is well-known. Uh, and I, if I'm not interested in that, may know nothing of it. Let, let me give you a measure of how well-known this Bible verse is. If you download a particular electronic version of the Bible onto your computer, you will find that the default verse highlighted when that software opens is John 3, verse 16. And unless you go and use the bookmarks down the right-hand side of the software window, you'll find that if you click on one of those accidentally while you're doing something else, you'll be back to John 3, verse 16. So that particular uh, publisher of a, a way of looking at the Bible on your computer thinks that this is an important verse to have there uh, in front of you. And I suppose, in a way, he's right. Because what this verse does, first of all, in our generation, in our current state of the world, is reassure us of something which, I'm sad to say, so many people might doubt. Yes, the writing of the verse in the first century of the Christian era is written in the past tense God so loved the world but the point of the Christian message of course is that God does still love the world and sadly there are far too many people today I would submit who think that well some of them don't think there is a God but others have begun to have doubts and perhaps wonder whether God does care and the simple answer from the pages of the Bible is this that God did create all things with a purpose and he still cares right through human history he has interacted with his creation and he still cares and demonstrates that he proves it and I suppose it's fair to say that this particular topic we're looking at today is the most important the paramount example of that that God so loved the world that he sent his son his only begotten son notice here that the apostle John who by some has been criticized for not mentioning the uh, virgin birth in his opening to his gospel actually goes to the trouble of referring to the fact that Jesus was the begotten son of God but God's care for the world is demonstrated much earlier and in many ways uh, also so for instance we could go back through the page of the Old Testament and look at verses that reassure us that God does care, that he loves his world that he created. And there are just a couple of verses I'd like to refer to. One I'm, I'm going to just quote, and the other, if you wish to turn to the book of Psalms, you can look at that with me. But in the prophecy of Hosea, God actually states in the middle of a passage about the problems that he was having with his nation and the fact that he could have punished them for their wickedness but he then says I am God and not man man who so often reacts petulantly selfishly to any slight let alone any real hurt is shown up in contrast to the God who even though people had abandoned him nevertheless still maintained his love for them and in terms of the sort of issue that some may identify in our world today where there are so many have nots and you wonder sometimes 
how those who have can justify the way they treat the have-nots. If you're in any doubt, you can turn almost anywhere in the page of the Bible to see what God has done, what standards God has set. And in this particular verse in Psalm 68 verse 5, God chooses to come from a magnificent opening uh, praise that King David has written concerning him and then God inspires David to say this of him the one who rules everything that he is a father of the fatherless a defender or an advocate of widows this is God in his holy habitation he sets the solitary in families he brings out those who are bound into prosperity. God can reverse the difficult situations of some and those who are stuck in a, a bad way will find that God is on their side. That is what he's saying. God not only cares for his creation in general but is concerned about individuals as well in particular. And this is a major subject we could uh, do a study on to show that God is shown in the Bible as a caring God and sometimes in the past there have been those who have suggested that there are two gods in the Bible one in the Old Testament who's, a, who's the God of power and vengeance and it's only when you come to the New Testament you find the God of love that is not the case God has always been a God of love God has also always been the God of power and willing to take vengeance on those who ignore his commandments and <coughs> oppress others. There's a, a verse in another of the prophets, the prophet Amos, where God sets out the punishments that will come on nations around. And it almost reads like a, an Old Testament version of the Geneva Convention condemning the sort of atrocities that these nations were perpetrating in their self-interest. And there's a terrible little phrase there that would resonate quite well in, in, in news headlines today concerning genocide for territorial advantage. God condemns it and says they will not go unpunished. Let's never forget that God cares. <coughs> But this New Testament statement by Jesus himself takes things to yet another level. Let's just carefully think about the phraseology in this well-known verse. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He didn't send his son into the world to condemn it, we're told in the next verse. Now, it's interesting to know that when you look at God sending people, there are in fact two particular people in the Bible, other than Jesus, of whom it is said that God sent them. And one of the interesting and, and quite important principles of learning from the Bible and of Bible study is to follow the pattern, to look for a pattern because God has often placed little gems of extra dimension, extra information, extra poignancy sometimes in the way he has put a pattern down and we can pick up hints from that. So who are the two men of the Old Testament of whom it is said that they were sent by God. And in fact they are two giants of Old Testament uh, record. And very appropriate uh, as patterns if you like. Leading up to the Lord Jesus being sent. I'm now looking in Genesis chapter 45. And uh, towards the beginning of that chapter. We have an exchange here. In the, uh, the well-known story, uh, and I suppose even those who don't know their Bibles particularly well 
may have come across uh, this story because of its portrayal in uh, a musical form, the story of Joseph and his brothers. And at the point where Joseph makes himself known to his brothers, that this man who is standing before them, the right-hand man of the Pharaoh of Egypt, who is holding their lives and their future in his hand, I'm actually the brother you treated so badly. And they are not only astounded, but of course worried. In case Joseph would behave in the way I mentioned before, spitefully, petulantly, retributing upon themselves the ill treatment they gave him. And he said, no, no, no. It was not you who sent me here. It wasn't you that sold me into slavery, he says. Joseph, don't, don't think of it that way. Here, here's a real um, way of uh, rethinking the situation. God sent me here. He has made me this great man, a father to Pharaoh, lord of all his house, a ruler throughout the land of Egypt. So, and he and goes on in the next verse as well. And he sends message back with his brothers to his father in the land of Canaan. Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not tarry. It is quite clear that God sent me before you to preserve this posterity. That they, they, the family might continue. Otherwise, they could have died out as the dreadful famine of that era spread and affected the whole region. God sent me, says Joseph. When you look into the life of Joseph, you realise just how much of an appropriate pattern there is in this man's life for the sending of Jesus Christ all those centuries later. Joseph was ill-treated by his brothers. He was hated because of what he said about what would happen in the future. And lo and behold, what he said was right. Jesus, of course, was rejected by his own nation when he came. They didn't like what he taught, they didn't like what he predicted would happen. But we, with the benefit of our historical records and our hindsight, can see that what Jesus said was right about what would happen to his nation in the following years. Joseph was a means of saving people from a dreadful future and death by famine. And of course, interestingly enough, because the rest of the family of uh, Jacob, or Israel as he's also known, the children of Israel ended up in Egypt. Of course, that is where that other fairly well-known Old Testament story of the Exodus comes in. Yes, I'm of the right generation to have seen a certain film when I was uh, uh, just a lad. The book of Exodus, the story of a man leading a nation out from Egypt into a wilderness to an uncertain future to them, but one which God had promised. And again, when you come just over into the second book of the Bible, into Exodus chapter 3, from the book of Genesis into Exodus chapter 3, you there find... Again, that incident of Moses seeing a bush burning in the middle of the wilderness where he was working with the sheep. And suddenly there's this bush on fire, but it's not being burnt away by the fire. And he meets the angel of the Lord speaking from that bush. And he is told verse 12 of Genesis 3 
this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. Moses would be absolutely sure that he had been sent by God when his endeavours to bring the people out of Egypt and to serve God back in this mountain are fulfilled. And then verse 13, Moses says to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. So he got the message and he says, Well, how am I going to identify you when I go and say that you have sent me? Now, what we have then is now the man who was instrumental in saving the lives of his relatives and getting them uh, to safety with food supplies in Egypt, being sent by God. And now the man who is going to rescue that family, now grown into a nation, out of that uh, situation that has now come on them in Egypt, Moses, he also is told that he is sent by God. And so we see the pattern again. A man is sent to save people from a terrible situation. They were being, <coughs> pardon me, awfully ill-treated. They were not only made to be slaves and work for the king, but the king had genocide in mind. He wanted to kill off all the male Jewish children so that he could uh, eliminate any prospect of opposition from that quarter in due time. And Moses was sent to save his people by bringing them out from the land of Egypt. So there's a pattern. God sends people to save his own people from a terrible situation, from death by famine, from oppression, from bondage, from murder, from all the things that sadly still going on in our world. But is that all it is? is? Is Jesus just another one in this line of people that God sends to rescue a situation in a particular era of history? Well, no. Let's go back and have a look carefully at what this well-known verse of the New Testament, probably claimed to be the best-known verse in the Bible, actually says. In fact, let's look wider at the whole context of what is being said in this discourse in John chapter 3. A very senior man from the Jewish council called Nicodemus has come to, uh, well, as we'd say today, he'd come to suss out what was going on. He came at night because he didn't want to be seen. He didn't want it to be known that a, a leading light in the council was uh, talking to this man whose uh, teachings already were causing consternation in uh, religious and political circles in the land of Israel. So Nicodemus comes at night and, and has this intense discussion with Jesus. Jesus talks about uh, being born again, being born of water and of the Spirit. Of course, the leaders were well aware that uh, there was this man John, a friend indeed, a relative of Jesus, who was out in the wilderness earlier baptizing people and saying, repent, turn away from your sins. This was a a renewal crusade being led by John. Now, what was this man Jesus on about with his teaching? We need to know. I need to know. It's quite clear Nicodemus was interested from his own point of view, not just from the, his uh, position on the council. And uh, Jesus gets into a, quite a, a technical discourse with him. But then he comes up with this, um, if you like, revelation of the fitting of an Old Testament pattern into what it was foreshadowing. That the Son of Man, a reference to Jesus himself, must be lifted up that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 
course, this is uh, a coded reference, you might uh, realise, not very coded, I suppose, to the fact that Jesus would die being lifted up on a cross. He was crucified by the Roman authorities after the Jewish authorities had finally conspired against him and managed to uh, put some trumped up charges together. But Jesus is saying that this is part of God's pattern and plan and then he goes on to say that that well known set of words God so loved the world that is why that uh, that statement he's made that the son of man will be lifted up because for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son now it's in the next verse it talks about him sending his son but you see there's this other verb used now he gave his son he sent him but he had also given him so that he might in his death and resurrection bring about God's plan of salvation because we're not talking about just saving one family from death by famine one nation from slavery and uh, genocide we are talking about saving the world I've said before, when you come across statements like this, it, it almost sounds like the title of an action movie, doesn't it? We're going to save the world um, from some threat that some author has dreamt up. But this is not a dreamt up threat. This is a real and present danger. And this is what Jesus has come to solve. To save people. The world might be saved. What was it? That, what was the problem? If it wasn't famine. If it wasn't slavery. If it wasn't genocide. If it wasn't oppression. If it wasn't all those other things. What was it? And... Just briefly, may I suggest that what you do, if you wish to uh, look into this in the broader sense, is to look in the gospel records for yourself at what Jesus was saying in his teaching at this part of his uh, three-year ministry. What was it that was grabbing the authorities' attention that made Nicodemus come to him? Uh, and, and I'm not necessarily saying this is in, in the time scale, but because we're not given them, um, you know, dateline, whatever, on each chapter. But around this time of Jesus' ministry, he was saying things, the authorities were saying, oh, this man's saying things, what's going on? We need to find out. Now, one of the things which I know I've uh, spoken about from this lectern before, is one of the things that Jesus said uh, when he was confronted with these same rulers. There was an occasion when he was... Uh, preaching in uh, Galilee when uh, a concerted effort was made by the Jewish uh, leaders to go and listen to what this man was on about. They were getting worried already at that early stage. If you'd like to just pick up on this, um, can I suggest that we just look very briefly in um, at Mark chapter 2. It just gives us an idea of what the authorities made of the teaching of Jesus. It's one of the other gospel records actually that tells us that there were leaders of the people come from all over the country together on this particular day listening to him when he healed a paralysed man and what he said was this is verse 5 of Mark chapter 2 your sins are forgiven you that's what he said to the man and the authorities who were there some of the scribes said why does this man speak blasphemy like this who can forgive sins but God alone now can I just say that actually they were almost right the Old Testament specifically says that the merciful God can forgive. To God belong 
forgiveness and mercy. But the Old Testament doesn't preclude God delegating that power to his own son that he'd sent for the purpose. And they'd missed that from their reasoning. And Jesus deliberately raises the issue with them by saying this. And so that they would know that the Son of Man, as he says, has authority on earth to forgive sins, he healed the man. I can say to him, your sins are forgiven, or I can say, pick up your bedroll and go out. But so you know I've got the authority to forgive sins, I'm going to heal this man. And there you go, he's walking out with his bedroll rolled under his arm. Fit him well. So Jesus raises the stakes here to the question of forgiving sins. And the crowd say, we've never seen it done like this. Well, of course not, because under the Jewish uh, law, the forgiveness of sins was a ritual that took place on one day a year. On the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. They never heard somebody come along and say, I can forgive your sins today. You are well, you walk out. No wonder that the authorities were concerned with the effect of this man's teaching. And of course, when you go back in Bible teaching, you will realise the significance of this because it is clear that it is sin that Jesus now says he has the authority from his father to forgive it is sin that leads to death for everybody not just for those who are maltreated or, or murdered by an oppressive regime for those who face death through uh, starvation through famine as it was in the times of Joseph no 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 anybody everybody faces death and that is what Jesus says he now has the power to tackle he can forgive sins and if sin is beaten then death is beaten as some of his disciples make clear in the New Testament letters as well the forgiveness of sins being saved from death that is why God sent his son so that by his death even though he didn't deserve to die because he had lived a sinless life by his death and then his father's righteous act in raising him from the dead Jesus as the apostle Paul says becomes the first fruits of a great harvest of people who can live again that is what Jesus was trying to get across to Nicodemus. That is the message of this exceptionally well-known verse. Well, I've suggested that you have a, a look at the, um, the gospel records to see what exactly Jesus was teaching as he went about the country. There's one other part of the Bible I'd like to recommend to you, and, and that is the book of Hebrews. This is a, a treatise on the new situation. Jesus had met Nicodemus and had tried to point out to him that this was now a new era. There was something radically different afoot. Because God had actually sent his son to solve the problem of sin and death. And to give people the opportunity of being saved. And as that <clears throat> phrase recurs there, to have eternal or everlasting life granted to them. But when we come to the book of Hebrews, this is a book written to explain to those Jews who had 
converted to Christianity, seeing in Jesus the fulfillment of God's promise of a Messiah, we have laid out for us the exceptional nature of, of God's plan, and indeed of another pattern that God had set in the Old Testament that Jesus fulfilled. The concept of a priesthood, somebody who could act as a priest, as an intermediary between mankind and their God. But, but Jesus is different from any other priest who had gone before, let alone any who have claimed to hold that office since. Jesus had died as a sacrifice as well as acting as a priest interceding between the worshipper and their God. Uh, there's so much else in that book of Hebrews but you begin to get a feel for the fulfilment of the pattern. That is why it's not just because it's written to a Jewish audience particularly, but it's because it's fulfilling that pattern that there are so many quotations from the Old Testament scriptures in that book. And you begin to realise how the whole thing comes together and gels into one glorious fulfilment of God's plan. Let me just conclude by reading to you from a little New Testament I have in my hand here which is a, a very old book it's actually a translation known as the Bible in Basic English which is a restricted vocabulary uh, translation of the Bible my eye was just caught by this particular verse in Hebrews chapter 9 we've seen what Jesus said to Nicodemus the Jewish ruler about his having been sent by God because of God's love for the world and his wish to save people and to be able to give them everlasting life. The Bible has far more to say on this subject of that salvation. But just consider this, the last verse of Hebrews chapter 9. So Christ, having at his first coming taken on himself the sins of men will be seen a second time just notice there a reference to the return of Jesus to complete this wonderful plan of God Christ will be seen a second time without sin by those who are waiting for him for their salvation. And as Jesus explained. To that Jewish ruler Nicodemus. All those years ago. That salvation. From sin and death. Is what opens up promise. In God's kingdom. Of everlasting life.